Well, pull up a chair and set a spell here at Tales from SYL Ranch Live, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Well, tonight we have a show I wasn't really expecting to have, but I got back early from uh, my trip out to my family ranch land. And so I thought, what the hell, Doctor Who's been on, I might as well do a review of it. I uh, always like to at least try to get these somewhere around the dates that the show has uh, come on because, well, you like to be first when it comes to doing reviews on YouTube. So to explain my show for the benefit of people who may not be coming in right at the top of the hour or people who are watching this in the archives, if you are, hello, feel free to go look at my previous work. I have a lot of it. I've got 300 or so videos. I do live reviews, and sometimes I do serious films, sometimes I do schlock just for the kicks of it, and sometimes I do films or TV shows that have a wide appeal, like Doctor Who, partly because I like it and partly because it's good for the views. Uh, I usually, however, stick to a period from about 1900 to 1980, and that's because the period after that is pretty, pretty well documented. Uh, 1900 to 1980, however, does contain quite a lot of science fiction and a lot of science fiction fandom that is not documented and is sort of being lost to time. So I try to do some documenting on this show. I will take any and all questions, comments, and nasty remarks. I will respond to as many of viewers as I possibly can, and you can tell me if I miss something, if I'm completely full of crap, or if I just happen to be amazingly awesome, which is probably more likely. As they often say, um, I, you know, I, I, I do go into more depth than most reviewers. I don't just talk about the episode and whether I liked bits and pieces of it or not, and you know, the overall thing. I go into acting, directing, cinematography, mechanics of making a movie, and I can do this to some extent uh, because a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor, and so I can speak with a little bit of authority. Not as much as a modern actor working today, and I never want to give that, that impression but with some authority. As they often say, those who can do and are those who can't teach. And I think probably reviewing falls into that category. So, hey, Larry, Larry, nice to see you here tonight. Hopefully some of my regulars will get the message that I was having a show that I didn't expect. Um, I did, like I say, I got back early from the family ranch land and uh, I thought, well, Doctor Who's here. It'll get some views. <laughs> I'll do it right away rather than wait a week. So here I am. Now, in terms of context, because when you get to older films that I usually do, I like to do context setting. So that the viewer hopefully can, one of my viewers can watch and see and kind of figure, okay, this is what life was like back then. Well, we're in 2018. This episode takes place in 2018. We're all watching it in 2018. There's very little um, to uh, put in terms of context. People watching this now understand where we're at. The only thing that I would mention in terms of context is the fact that they have done the same thing here that they do have done with a, a lot of other doctors, which is you have a significant period of time, months, uh, between the doctor uh, having changed. And that's probably a really smart thing to do. Capaldi was not my favorite doctor by any means, and I'll talk about him and not him so much. It was Stephen Moffat's fault. Um, I will talk about that a little bit later, but he was not my favorite doctor. I was not sorry to see him go, not because of anything Capaldi did, but because of Moffat. I was glad to see the back of him, and sadly, because of what he'd done to the doctor, kind of had to take him with him. Um, but there, was a, there were people who were invested in that character, and I certainly understand that. So, leaving time between losing the Doctor and then seeing the new one is really smart. It gives the viewer a chance to kind of go, okay, I'm over that now. Uh, you know, it, it's one of the smart things they do. It's one of the smart things they do, and they continue to do it here. And I would hope they continue to do it throughout, because it is a smart thing to do. It lets the fans, you know, sort of come to terms with this being gone, and then kind of being excited for the next one. And when I watch, I watch um, certain reactors, that's people who will watch an episode and react to it live. And, um, you know, one of them in particular was very, very invested in Capaldi as the doctor. And she 
was very upset, you know, crying and things like that when he regenerated. But I watched her reaction of the uh, of this episode, and she was all up and hyped about it. So, you know, again, clearly, smart thing to do. Let your viewer get over, you know, losing one character, sort of, and going on to the next. Smart, smart thing to do. So that's really the only context that I have to set here, is just remember that they're probably doing that on purpose, you know, so that you have time to get over the last doctor before you get into the new one. And yes, Larry, Larry, too bad the late rain made me leave the ranch early. Yeah, yeah, it's always a danger out there. Uh, you know, if there's much precipitation, there's this one hill you have to get up, and the bottom of that hill turns into slick mud. Um, I possibly could have gotten out of it with, with my Jeep, but I didn't really want to chance it because I didn't have that much in the way of provisions. If you're going to chance it, you have to be willing to be out there for weeks or more. If you're out there in the wintertime, uh, forget it. You're there for six months. So, non-spoiler review of this episode. Um, it's okay. It had a somewhat derivative story, and probably obviously so. It had some good performances that were not especially memorable. It is a decent Doctor Who first episode. Um, the rest of the series will tell, tell the tale in terms of whether it's going to be good or not. This one certainly did not blow my socks off. It was a decent enough first episode. You know, you're not going to get anything too terribly deep. What you're trying to do is make sure that the viewer can accept this new actor as the doctor. That is the biggest problem that they always have with these first episodes. The viewer has to buy it. And so they don't necessarily take a lot of chances with those episodes. And I think that was probably the case here. So with that out of the way, I can issue me a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert. And that is because I am the fan die master. And that means that the fandom is strong with me. And that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about a half hour early. This is not a boast. This is not a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see this new stuff for everything that came before, and you find that there isn't much that's new in the world. And certainly, sadly, that was the case with this episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> Saw everything coming. Nothing in this episode was a surprise to me at all. Okay, to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the female doctor. Um, I would have to say, you know, in terms of whether or not that's a big event, I was interested, I was looking forward to it, but uh, yeah, not a brag, just a fact, sadly, as Larry Larry says. <laughs> but again, you know, everybody, there were a lot of fans who were worried that this was going to turn into some kind of social justice warrior feminist nonsense. And with respect to that, at least in this episode, I had to say, meh, it is not all social justice warrior, at least so far. I think... I don't know what to make of the fact that the two male characters um, have some deficits, each of them. But it isn't going full social justice warrior or, you know, out in your face feminism. This is, as I thought it might be, at least the, in this episode, it's just the doctor with a female actor. Meh. Um, it's still just the doctor. And I totally buy Jodie Whittaker as the doctor. And that's what this episode was supposed to do, make you buy the doctor. But otherwise, in terms of the big controversy, at this point in the first episode, I would have to say, meh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. This is just a doctor with a female actor. So I usually like to try to go into the plot to some detail. Uh, I have it all written down, and it's lengthy. It's rather lengthy. The problem is this could be one of my shorter reviews because I didn't set any context. I could sit out here and read out the entire plot to you, but to be perfectly honest, it's not worth that amount of effort. <laughs> I just don't think it's worth that amount of effort. Uh, like I say, I, I, I ran through this twice, and I went, God, this is long. And God, I'm not sure anybody will follow it. And in any case, I think this is a pretty mediocre episode anyway. 
Um, I would say about the plot in general. We are introducing the Doctor and our new companions. The plot involves an alien who's come to Earth to hunt humans and how they foil him. And I have some cringe moments about that. But mostly, this episode is there to introduce the Doctor and the new companions, to give us some idea of how they're going to interact and how they know each other and things like that. And we do have some. Uh, two of the main characters do know each other from uh, you know, a school relationship. And, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, well, those two know each other, and then there's another two who know each other because of familial things. Um, aside from that, you know, I mean, that's the basic plot. Alien comes to Earth, threatens people, and is ultimately foiled in the end by the doctor pulling a switcheroo. Um, the doctor, they have put, the alien has put explosives, sort of. It's, it's something that eats away your DNA, apparently. And uh, the doctor manages to get those into the alien, and so the alien ultimately destroys himself when he pushes the button. Um, there just isn't a whole hell of a lot to it beyond that. It is really just introducing us to these characters. And again, they have to do a story that is, you know, enough in what we expect from Doctor Who that we will buy a female Doctor. That was a big risk for them. To, you know, I mean, as much as you know, fans occasionally were whining about it. And to be honest, to be honest, I don't think very many fans are whining about it. I really don't. I think it's an extraordinary minority. You're talking about a fan group here that has been fine with strong female characters dating back to at least 1965 with Star Trek's first pilot, The Cage. It was not so much okay with the networks, apparently, at least not that actress. But fans have been fine with it. Fans have been fine with strong female characters since forever. That has never changed in the 53 years of my life that cover from the beginning. I started out, I was born the year that the cage was finished. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, Fans just have never cared. You know, we're pleased to see it from time to time, but we don't care. And I don't think that there was a very large group of fans who cared. I think this one was just, okay, that's cool, let's see how it works for most people. There were some vocal fans who were, you know, yammering about it, but I think, I suspect, I, you know, we still have to wait and see the series, but I suspect that all that yammering is going to be completely unfounded. And, and again, most fans, we've been fine with this since at least 1965 and probably earlier. If you look at some of Heinlein's earlier works in print, there are some strong female characters there. And we certainly don't have any problem with them in Star Wars, by the way, Kathleen Kennedy. We've been seeing them in Star Wars. You do know that you have at least one show on with a, with a female lead. Okay, it's not human beings, it's CGI. But she's still a female lead, and nobody is complaining about that. But yes, Larry, Larry, this was a predator-type story, and that it leads me straight into cringe moments, which I always like to get out of the way, and there are a few here. Um, let me scroll down to my notes so I can find them. Um, yeah. The show itself, the plot, is extremely derivative of Predator. Very, very derivative of Predator. It was one of the reasons that I saw everything coming, because it was a Predator story without the gore. Um, thank goodness Stephen Moffat is gone. He might want to show us the gore. But it's like Predator without the gore. And, and, and without all the crazy action, you know, they get into insane action things and have since the 80s on that one. You know, looking back as a, you know, the Fandai master, I can say that the 80s were when movies started changing into crazy, insane action. And now they're doing all the action with CGI. So human characters not bound in some kind of magic iron suit or something like that. Human characters will do things that will usually kill them in movies. I, you know, the one that always struck me, there's a scene, I think, in um, 
Oh, well, Star Trek Into Darkness, where Kirk is sliding down an incline that's about like you know, this angle, right? He's sliding down, then it's about 100 feet long, and he lands and he's fine. You know, it, that doesn't happen. <laughs> if you go down something like that, you're probably dead. At the very least, your legs are, you know, hips are probably shattered from the impact. And they do this thing, this sort of thing all the time. They started doing that in the 80s, and it's just been totally ratcheted up to the point where when I watch it, I'm like, oh, God, please, you know, like Kirk falling down and sliding down an incline like that. Crazy. Um, so this is Predator without the crazy. It is, you know, more low-key, a little more personal, um, but it's still just a derivative of Predator, and that's one of the cringe moments. Uh, other cringe moment, I saw all of the major plot points coming, every single one of them. I hate when that happens. I really would like it if, if, a, if a movie or TV series would surprise me. And, um, you know, Doctor Who has, to date, been one that can surprise me pretty regularly. Not always, but pretty regularly. This time, no surprise for me whatsoever. I knew everything was going to happen, including um, one character's grandmother being killed. It just, it just screamed at me. I mean, part of the problem is that I'm you know, plugged into fandom enough that I knew who the companions were going to be. And so I knew she wasn't going to be a companion. So one of two things could happen. Before I walked into this, I mean, one of two things could happen. Either she'll be left behind for some reason, or um, she'll die. Well, she's married to Graham, so of course she dies. You know, she there, there was just saw it coming a million miles away. The moment I knew that she was married to him, I knew she was a goner because they were not going to just let him leave his wife behind. She was a debtor, and uh, I saw that coming. Uh, you haven't seen this episode, may never seen it, or Predator. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Larry. Larry, and Doctor Who is your favorite Doctor? Yes, yeah, I uh, Tom Baker rather. Tom Baker is my Doctor. Um, I think most people tend to get most emotionally invested in the Doctor that they saw first. You know, some people who for whom Capaldi is the first Doctor are probably the people who are most invested in him. Uh, for me, you're like you, uh, Larry. Larry, it's Tom Baker um, when he was in uh, the Day of the Doctor. Um, that was an amazing moment. Um, yeah, he was much older, but, you know, that whole line where he goes, who knows, and does that thing at the side of his nose like he used to do. Great moment. Uh, I was really glad that they were able to include it in the 50th. It is one of the reasons that the 50th anniversary, the Day of the Doctor, is the best Doctor Who episode ever. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit later, but... Uh, other things that struck me as cringe moment. How did the doctor survive that fall? You know, we left her almost not quite on a cliffhanger. She had only always fallen down the cliff. She had already fallen off. Well, we know from Tom Baker, as Larry says, still him, old or otherwise. Larry, Larry says, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's, it's still him. The interesting, just as an aside, the interesting thing about that was if you watch that exchange between them and he goes, who knows? Who knows? And then he turns to walk away, but he looks down first. I figured out what that was. Watching the episode, I figured out what that was. Tom Baker is significantly shorter <laughs> than Matt Smith. They put him on, on some kind of stand or a riser to raise him up about a foot. So the reason he looks odd when he's looking away, because it does look odd, well, the reason he's odd looking away is because he's watching the ground to make sure that he doesn't trip and fall over it, you know, because he's an older guy. The cane is real. He does limp some. Um, I just, you know, there he is. He's looking down, and, and if you, because the angle is like, you know, this roughly. He's, I guess, over here he's talking. And then his eyes go like this, and it looks kind of odd. But then I realized, oh, okay. They're, uh, they're, they're, he's looking down. He's looking down to see his steps so that he doesn't fall and trip and kill himself. So, I uh, haven't seen this episode of uh, New Doctor, may never see any of New Doctor. I don't think it's necessarily worth not seeing. Um, it's just this one was pretty damn predictable. Um, we'll see how it goes. We'll just see how it goes. Um, okay, so we know the Doctor can be killed by a fall of... I don't know what that would have been. Maybe five stories. How did she survive? You know, we saw her, f we, last we saw of her, she was falling down from a rather extraordinary altitude, bordering on space. 
How did she survive that? And it's not answered. It's not answered. She just crashes in. Like, what? Were you just going to totally cheat on us and, and not give us anything for that cliffhanger? Okay. So they did, and it turned into a cringe moment for me because, like, I know he can be, she could be killed much easier than that. I saw my doctor get killed that way. So they just cheated, didn't tell us anything about it. Larry Lira says, I hope was, if you were hoping the Amanda Tapping would be the new doctor. I don't think they'll ever do a doctor who's not outright British. I know she spent some time growing up there, but that's different. I think they'll always have a very British doctor. Um, my other cringe moment, oddly enough, is a cringe moment that you usually just overlook, right? And that's why are these people taking their cues with the, from the doctor exactly? Why? Uh, because the doctor always does this. He, now she, comes into a situation, pretty much takes charge, and everybody does what she says. Here, because it was human beings rather than aliens or somebody on another planet, I found it harder to buy, oddly enough. Um, just a little harder to buy. You know, they're, they're just like going off and doing this stuff when I think, you know, the average person, particularly somebody who's like a police constable like one was, is probably more bound to try to call in reinforcements. I mean, that's what's happened in the past to some extent. It's why we get unit involved still in these adventures because people will have a problem that they know they can't handle themselves, so they call unit. You know, it's one of those deals where it's weird because I have to say to myself, the doctor always does this. The doctor always comes in where ever he she is and completely takes over and nobody questions it here with human beings it just was a little odd you know i would have almost been one of those deals where you know i know what's going to happen after this episode after this episode unit's going to come in and clean up after the doctor i suspect that's what the unit does a lot is clean up after the doctor um but again you know the, the human beings just taking it as red that she knows what the hell she's doing, you know, that she's not just crazy. Um, again, just, you know, a little much, a little much. Canada is sort of British, Larry Larry says. Yeah, in a way. I mean, they used to be outright British. I, I, I'm not sure where that stands anymore. I know at one time, you know, the Queen was their monarch. Um, not anymore, or at least not functionally anymore. I'm not sure how that works. Like Australia has a governor general that uh, is uh, of uh, Great Britain. So there are some great moments. There are some great moments. And the biggest one is that this, on many levels, is a very distinct change from the Capaldi era. And that's a very good thing. As I said, I think Stephen Moffat jumped the shark with uh, uh, Day of the Doctor. It's the best Doctor Who episode ever it's the best one in my opinion that has ever been done and may never be outdone so Moffat's problem is he hit the top there's nowhere else to go he hit the summit there is nowhere else to go from there and so what he did with Capaldi was do with what a lot of artists do when they run out of ideas when they've hit that pinnacle and there's nowhere else to go he went dark, just dark. He should have left when Matt Smith left. But what he did was he transformed the show from a fairy tale, which it very explicitly had been under Matt Smith. Interesting things about Matt Smith's tenure, if you watch, if you listen, sometimes the lines being delivered are almost verse. You know, when, when Rose, and, and, and not Rose, but I guess Bad Wolf Girl, in uh, Day of the Doctor, says she says she's opening a tangle in time. Let's see if I can get the... A tangle in time to the days to come, uh, to the man today will make of you. A tangle in time to days to come, to the man who today will make of you. Damn near verse. And he did that a lot. It was whole hammering home this sort of, you know, this is a fairy tale. The Doctor is a fairy tale. That's how the Doctor works best. When he is a really good person, 
who transforms, either directly or indirectly, the people around him into better people. Not when you blow a hole through one of your companion's chests. That is not cool. And there were a lot of other things, you know, production-wise. If you just look at the lighting, the lighting was very, very washed out through the entire time. His lighting was radically different from Matt Smith's, and it's very different from this. It was washed out. He just decided, let's go down that path. Let us make him completely dark. Uh, Larry Larry says, uh, Capaldi did nothing for me. Yeah, me either, and it's not Capaldi's fault. It was the fault of Steve Moffat, who jumped the shark on Day of the Doctor and should have left with Matt Sliff Smith at the end of the time of the Doctor. What he did with that character was horrifying. It was literally turning a uh, character who works best as a fairy tale into a horror story. Uh, Marcel says, you're late. Could I start over? <laughs> no, not really. Um, I guess I could say this. I think it's a mediocre episode. As I'm saying, I'm going through the, the great moments here, and, and one of the ones was this radical change in tone in every way. Just look at the doctor's costume. You know, previous doctor, generally kind of black or dark. Look at the lighting. It's much brighter. It is not washed out, you know, which it's like Batman. You know, the, Batman works great washed out, but Superman doesn't, and neither does the doctor, really. So they've radically changed that. They've changed some of how they're doing production design. So all good things, in my opinion. You know, I always like to say there is the John Nathan Turner rule. John Nathan Turner, if you don't know, was producer of Doctor Who and actually got the show canceled. He actually got it fracking canceled. Um, and the reason he got, how he got it canceled is very simple. He took the Doctor too dark. The John Nathan Turner rule is... When you make the Doctor too dark, people stop watching. I hope that they have that as a big, giant banner in the writer's room at the current Doctor Who people. I hope they have that because it's true. If you take the Doctor too dark, nobody wants to watch. People stop watching. And um, that is, uh, that's borne out by the numbers Yesterday, this episode had the best ratings, the highest ratings, since Matt Smith's last episode, The Time of the Doctor. People had been tuning out because the Doctor went too dark. Now, it's okay to have some darkness. The Doctor always deals with people being killed. It's not even unusual to get yourself killed in one of these episodes. It's why, you know, Unit, when they talk about it, they say, yes, we all, we all want to meet him but we dread the day that that comes because you know something horrible is happening and people could die, you know. Um, you could die. So it, it's, it's, it works best with that. You can be dark there. You can be dark when you're talking to the Daleks or something like that. But you can't be dark all the time. You, know, you can't have your companions die like Clara did in a horrible fashion, and then the second one died in a way that got a big, giant hole in her chest on screen. At least it wasn't dripping blood. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so, you know, at least there's that. At least there's that. We have gotten back to the John Nathan Turner rule. When you make the Doctor too dark, people stop watching. And there was a definite shift in tone here that I thought was very good. Uh, Marshall's saying, yeah, uh, I said it's a meh episode, yeah, but the first episodes are almost always meh until someone gets the chemistry working and do like the Doctor so far. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was saying. This episode is meh, but it was intended to introduce us to these characters. The biggest thing you always have to get over when you change a Doctor is, will people buy it? You know, will they buy this as the Doctor? And especially when you went to a female Doctor, the question is, are people going to buy it? So, yes, in that respect, it totally fulfilled the expectations for me. I totally believed Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. I totally believed the people that she's got now as uh, companions. Fine and dandy. Did what it was supposed to do. But it was not a sh an episode that jumps out at you. You know, I, To be honest, the 11th hour was one that jumped out at me. Um, you know, the fact that Stephen Moffat was doing a lot of time travel and started it right there, you know, with, you know, 
uh, Amy having waited and waited, you know, for a decade and then another two years, you know. So uh, that one I thought was a much nicer first episode, but this one was fine. It was fine. The story was derivative, predator, um, but it was okay from the perspective of trying to bring us into these new characters and will we buy this doctor? It was fine. It did that for me. So this is also another thing is they're moving back to a more action oriented doctor. This is also a good thing. And I predicted this myself before I even saw the Christmas episode. I thought there was going to, you know, doctor's going to regenerate. There's going to be some type of big thing that happens when she regenerates. And then we're going to be off straight into action. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, it's the sort of thing that people have been looking for in Doctor Who since the 2005 series started up again. It's something they came to kind of expect. And Capaldi, for various reasons, most of them the writing, could not do that. And, and there's other things that are involved in that that just have to do with his age and stamina. Making a TV series is a fantastically draining thing to do for everyone involved. I'm sure it's even worse for writers. If you want to hear about uh, J. Michael Straczynski, I you know, practically killed himself doing that show, doing Babylon 5. But it's still a really complex and difficult thing to do. As an actor, you're like up at six, into the makeup chair by seven if you, you know, don't have some nasty appliance makeup like you know, Michael Dorn did, in which case you're there two hours early. You know, you sit there and you get made up and then you start work at eight you go through till 6 p.m. and then you shut down because you can't run any longer than that because it'll cost extra money. And then you shut down, you go home, probably learn some more lines for like next week's show or maybe working on the ones for tomorrow because that's another thing. There's a whole bunch of techno babble in science fiction and particularly Doctor Who. There's a lot of techno babble. And these people aren't scientists. You know, they're not like me or even the average fan who spent their life with science fiction. And so, you know, if you say uh, we need to, uh, you know, restore plasma conduits to the shields. Oh, OK, we go. That's putting power to the shields. Got it. You know, so they have to memorize all this crap. And then they have these long work hours. And then there's the fact that Capaldi was older. If you put me in that, I don't think I'd be able to hand, handle the schedule alone. But beside, beyond that too old to run around, just too old to run around. You know, it's, it's not like, um, you know, previous doctors who could, you know, grab somebody's hand and just say, run, and off they are. This doctor is running around again, and I think that's intentional because the last doctor did not. It was something that people had come to associate with that show and probably one of the reasons it didn't get so much ratings. The main reason, of course, however, is... The John Nathan Turner rule. When you make the doctor too dark, people stop watching. Marshall says, yeah, Joe got a bit grouchy and uh, by a bit, uh, he's talking about J. Michael Straczynski, and by a bit, I mean to say the ravenous bug biter beast of trawl without, sta without standard his daily diet of grandmothers. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, you know, n n seeing his name all over the place, you know, I, you just have to, as, as somebody who used to be an actor, I go, yep. The, amount, the schedule he was keeping up, I can't imagine. I really can't imagine that schedule. You know, sitting in front of the typewriter, and he was responding to fans online. He lived, breathed, eat, slept, you know, Babylon 5. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be any ever getting away from it. So, yeah. And, you know, even just a single actor. This is tough to do. A TV series is tough to do. It's why you generally see younger people doing TV series because they have the stamina. They can keep up that very grueling schedule. Yes, run, doctor, as Larry Larry says. Yeah, the show is getting back to more of run, you know, and that's been associated with it since 2005. In fact, they've kind of retconned it to previous uh, doctors and the previous doctors to some extent did a little bit of running around but not like the one since 2005 and the loss of that in Capaldi I think was something that you know caused people to kind of drift away but but again not the main reason the main reason they drifted away was because they violated the John Nathan Turner rule when you make the doctor too dark people stop watching 
Uh, Marshall says he, and I think he's talking about JMS, was asked once uh, what he would do after the show ended. His reply, a nap, a very, very long nap on the order of weeks. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, I, you know, just knowing his seeing his name all over it and being active enough in fandom at that point to know that he was, you know, I think it was Genie, something nobody will ever remember. But I think it was Genie where he was talking to the fans a lot. God, you know, no time whatsoever in his day, I can't imagine. So getting into some of the production aspects of the show, the writing. Uh, it was written by Chris Chibnall, who is now the showrunner on Doctor Who and head writer. His IMDb, oh man, this is so weird to me. This is so weird to me because I generally do older films. And by the time I review them, the actors have had time to be around for 10, 20, 30. Some of them have been around for 50 years. So it's a little weird for me doing these IMDb's because they're sh so short by comparison. They're younger people who can keep up this grueling schedule. And so their IMDb's are n five, ten years. You know. Marshall says, you actually like Capaldi's portrayal. You can see he was a kid in his all-time favorite play playground. Oh, yeah, I liked Capaldi. Don't get me wrong. I thought he was great. It was the direction that his scripts were going under Stephen Moffat, who, in my opinion, jumped the shark with The Day of the Doctor. It is the pinnacle. It's the best Doctor Who episode ever. And there is no way to go anywhere but down from there. And so he ran out of ideas, so he went dark, as artists often do. And the problem with that, of course, is when you make The Doctor too dark, people stop watching. I think that's probably the main reason that he had to leave. I think there was some conversation with uh, BBC executives where they said, um, Stephen, this ain't working. You gotta make the doctor more light. And he just didn't know how to do that, and so he's gone. Um, it's unfortunate for Capaldi. It's unfortunate for Capaldi uh, as a doctor. I think 10, 15 years down the road, we will look at Capaldi's doctor, sadly, the same way that we look at Colin Baker's doctor. Too dark, did not last long. But John Nathan Turner didn't learn his lesson and kept going darker. But the stories and stuff, and there's nothing wrong with Colin Baker, he's a fine actor, but he was given crap material. And unfortunately, I think that's kind of what Capaldi was given, was horror crap material. He, he was fine, it was just, he had to do this stuff. If they'd had somebody else, I, I think it would have been a very different story. But they didn't. They had a guy who jumped the shark. So Chris Chibnall, our uh, writer and new show runner on the show, his IMDb reads 2005 to present. That is a difficult thing for me to wrap my head around. Younger people watching me may go, okay, so. But I'm like, that's the year this series restarted. It's not that long ago for me. Uh, you know, I, I remember it as when my kids were little and we'd sit down and watch Doctor Who, which we used to do all the time. They've been around, this guy's been around less time than my kids have been alive. So, <laughs> gonna see that a lot. It just surprised me going through this because I'm used to these longer IMDb's that go back, you know, 20, 30 years. His is 2005 to present with 15 writing credits. However, boy, he did 15 episodes of Born and Bred, 24 episodes of Broadchurch, 10 episodes of Grace Point, 10 of Camelot, 8 of Torchwood, by the way, and 6 episodes of Law and Order UK. Um, so again, this is an example of where we might see only a single credit but that adds up to 25 episodes. And it's interesting to note that he did some uh, Torchwood. So. He's won awards. He won the, uh, let's see if I can get this right, Biarritz International Festival of Audiovisual Programming in 2015 for Broad to Church. Won the Broadcast Press Guild Awards in 2014 for Broad to Church. Won the UK TV Choice Awards UK in 2012 for Broad Church, and a, the Writers Guild of Great Britain for his 2007 episode of Doctor Who, and he's got 12 other nominations. Uh, his writing here is fine. I mean, this is not an episode that's going to jump out at you. Again, the point of this episode is 
to get it to the point where people will buy this new doctor and to some extent, you know, introduce the companions and stuff. Um, no doubt we will get into the companions later. One of the things about Doctor Who that not everybody really notices is the show is not so much about the doctor. The show tends to be about his companions and how the adventures they have and the things that he has to do. Now, and it's not to say the doctor doesn't have some character development. He does. But nearly, not nearly as much as the companions. And so the companions introducing those, also a good thing to do. And successfully, I thought. Uh, but the story, again, derivative. Um, it's like Predator without the gore. <laughs> um, and uh, fortunately, uh, Stephen Moffat isn't around. He'd probably put the gore in. Um, but again, everything about this, as the Fandai master who has watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction, I saw everything coming. Nothing was surprising. I have seen this story before, and it's derivative in many directions. So we will see how things go. You know, again, it's not necessarily true that they would write a brilliant episode first time out every time. The point is, will we buy this doctor? Put this doctor in a situation that is more or less comfortable and familiar to us so that we're not busy worrying about you know, plot points over here so much. We're taking in that we have a new doctor, and do we buy her? I'll get to her performance in a minute, but absolutely bought her. Absolutely bought her, and I think the fans that were really worried that this was going to turn into some sort of social justice warrior nonsense are probably mis um, unfounded. We'll see as things go on. I certainly didn't see it much last night. Sorry, yesterday afternoon. Don't tell anybody. I watched this sucker on my way home. <laughs> I I had it uh, pl sitting uh, over on the dashboard and uh, kind of glanced over at it from time to time. Uh, I didn't drive the whole way like that, and I watched it a couple of times again since to do the review, but that's where I saw it initially. About an hour after it had released, I was watching it in my car. It's the first time that's happened. Uh, it used to be I had to do torrents to even watch the thing. Now, four million streaming sites have it within an hour, so I don't even have to do that. Larry Larry says, to me, it was interesting to see the doctor work alone between the companions. Yeah, yeah. They can't do that very often because the companions serve a number of purposes, but one of them is to be the audience. You know, somebody to be around so that the doctor, who's way smarter than everybody, has somebody to tell what's going on so that the audience knows what's going on. It just gets complex sometimes. Um, but here, yes, I, I thought it was interesting to see her working alone as well. I, I thought that was interesting. Um, I'm curious to see where they're going to go with these characters. There's a problem to some extent, given the way the show has more been about the, the companions. When you have three of them, and they're not related. Well, there's one, there's one that is related. But when they're not, it's not like Amy and Rory, who are a married couple and sort of, you know, went together. They may have a problem. Uh, and as much as they now have three companions that they have to worry about in terms of character development instead of only one or maybe two. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where they go. Um, the Doctor has had more companions in the past, but the show at that point, you know, like when there was uh, uh, Nissa, Tegan, and Adric, for example. The show was not about running around. It, the show was not particularly about character development, nor about the companions specifically. Since 2005, it kind of has been. Um, so I'm kind of curious to see where they're going to go with this and whether they're going to successfully be able to tell the story of three people where they had previously only been doing one. So we'll see. In terms of the characters, we have the Doctor, played by Jodie Whittaker. IMDb is 2006 to present, with 50 acting credits. However, one of those translates into 24 episodes of Broadchurch. So the showrunner knew her from all the work he'd done on Broadchurch. And I haven't seen the show. I don't know anything about it. I'm hear I'm, I'm, I hear tell it's pretty good, but I haven't seen it. So I have no way to judge what she was doing there versus here. Um, she won some awards, the Royal Television Society a UK Award in 2014 for Broadchurch, and then has 12 other nominations. In terms of her performance, I think her performance here was fine. It, it is, I believe her as the doctor, I totally believe her, which again is probably the most important thing going into one of these new doctor episodes. 
do we buy this person as the doctor? And in particular this time, will we buy a woman as the doctor? Yes. <laughs> to be honest, I, you know, I was thinking about it. And, and when she was speaking, I could almost hear Matt Smith's voice. So that's a good thing. I did not hear Matt Smith's voice or anybody else with Capaldi. You know, he was just too old. Um, and it didn't work that way. With her, I can see, I can see the, uh, I can hear the lines coming out. And for me, it helps sell the fact that this is the doctor. And I'm sure that was on purpose. And I don't do this stuff by accident, particularly when they have months to work on it like they did. So, um, you know, I thought her performance was fine. I believe her. There is nothing here that really stretches her nor showcases her talent or anything like that. And we'll no doubt see more of that as time progresses. Again, point of these episodes, will we buy this new actor as the doctor? Will we buy the, the um, companions that we're giving the doctor? And the answer in this case is yes in both counts. Then there's Graham O'Brien as Bradley, I'm sorry, Bradley Walsh, rather, as Graham O'Brien, one of the other companions that's going to be coming along here. His IMDb, fortunately, is a little longer, 1993 to present with 24 acting credits. But again, oh my God, wow. One of those 24 acting credits is for 297 episodes of Coronation Street, which I understand is a, uh, a soap opera in the UK. So my guess, and I don't know this for sure, would be that's like our soap opera is a daily show. 297 episodes. That's pretty fracking amazing. He also did uh, 53 episodes of Law and Order UK, uh, 30, 37 episodes of Night and Day, and was in two episodes of the Sarah Jane Adventures. Um, his awards, he won the uh, 2006 British Soap Award for Broadchurch and has five other nominations. His performance, I would say, again, fine. Um, his reactions to the situation are believable in a way that we have not seen other companions be believable. Most of the companions are actually uh, like his wife, Grace. You know, they're, they're brave to some extent to start with. The difference would be like Mickey. But generally, they're kind of brave to start with. And when they get into doing stuff with the doctor, they on some level enjoy what they're doing. You know, doing these crazy action things that they have to do all the time. And so if we have us a character who is not all that heroic, he's more along for the ride until Grace is killed. Um, works for me in a way that sometimes it doesn't. You know, as I said, I often watch reactors. You know, there's a couple of them I really like. Um, uh, Seska Says, Jessica of the channel Seska Says. Uh, I like her. <laughs> Reaction videos are my guilty pleasure. Um, I understand why I do it. On the one level, you get some younger ones that I can imagine that strike me, you know, emotionally. Hey, these are kind of like my kids. And then you have Jessica from Siska Says, who, Jessica, if you ever happen to watch this and you wouldn't, you're a big, much bigger YouTuber than I am. If you ever happen to watch it, <laughs> Jessica's old enough that it's okay for me to think of her as sort of the girlfriend type. You know, it's like, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to sit down in front of the TV and uh, watch Doctor Who with her, you know? I always wonder whether these people are real. You know, you always have to wonder, are they just acting? I, I don't think so in her case. Um, but they, if they're not, they definitely wear their hearts on their sleeves. Um, I said it before, I can't do those reaction videos because I'd be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. It'd be pretty damn boring. <laughs> for half an hour, however long I edited it together. So, you know, these guys wear their hearts on their sleeves. Um, anyway, the performance here is fine. And one of the things about the reactors, particularly Jessica, you know, if something horrible is about to happen and you can see it coming, you know, like, don't go do that. She'll be like, no, don't go do that. I would never do that. I would walk away. I'd be going in the opposite direction. And so um, this character is kind of like that in some ways. Uh, Graham is a bit like that at the moment. I suspect it's something that he's going to overcome and get more brave as time goes on because this, the doctor has this habit of taking people and making them even better people than they were before, more heroic, more interested in doing things for the good of others. And so I suspect that's where we're going to head with this character. Um, I found his reactions to his wife's death generally believable. Um, and again, this is really just, ultimately, this whole episode is about setting things up. 
Do we buy the doctor? Will we accept the companions? And yes, yes, we do. Uh, then there's Tosin Cole as Ryan Sinclair. His acting is 2010 to present. God, I'm old. He has 22 acting credits to his name, and one of those I discovered was for Star Wars The Force Awakens, in which he plays Lieutenant Bastion. Not a clue. <laughs> Not that up on that, uh, on that movie to be able to tell you where uh, Lieutenant Bastion is. So, not a clue. No awards. Uh, his performance, I like him. Uh, of the three new uh, companions, he's the most developed in this episode. He has the most character development, which isn't surprising. You know, again, with three companions, they're going to have an issue where, you know, previously they could basically focus, you know, on that companion as long as they wanted. Here they're going to have to break it up. You know, if it's going to be an ensemble show, which I assume it's going to be, they're going to have to break it up. They're going to have some episodes about one character, some about others. Only 10 episodes this season, so I'm curious how they're going to work that out. I mean, uh, I guess you could do three episodes apiece on them, something like that. I don't know. We'll see. Um, that may turn out to be problematic. I don't know. We'll we'll see. I, it's it's something that when you've got this fast paced show that's generally been about the companions, can you break it up so that you have this character development for each? Other? Maybe they'll put it in individual episodes. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But otherwise, uh, I had no problem with his performance. Again, it's just setting the stage. It is setting the stage for this new Doctor with their new companions. Then we have Mandip Gill as Yasmin Khan, the police constable. Her IMDb is 2012 to present. With nine acting credits, and amazingly enough, again, I think she's on a soap. I think Holly Oaks is a soap, but she did 242 episodes of Holly Oaks. Again, it's one of those deals, you look at the IMDb, it says one credit, and then you look and you go, good God, 242 episodes, holy crap. You know, she's won no awards. Um, her performance, she has the least to do of all the companions here. She barely has a character at all. Really, we didn't see anything about her character. She's a cop. <laughs> That's the character we saw. Um, again, but episode is about every time you get a new doctor. The episode is about will you buy the doctor? Will you buy these companions we're going to give you? And that was fine. I, t I bought her. I bought her as a companion. She'll probably have more to do and more character development as we go on. We will see. Again, not the focus of one of these episodes. The beginning episode is usually about, will you accept this doctor? Then we have Sharon D. Cole as Grace O'Brien, the one who actually was brave in this episode. She, fortunately enough, her IMDb goes back to 1986 with 39 acting credits, one of which translates into 112 episodes of Holby City, which I have no idea what it is. With that number of episodes, I'd have to wonder if it wasn't a daily soap. No awards. And um, this one is a character. You know, she's the one, frankly, that we usually see as a companion. Um, you know, somebody who is somewhat brave just to start with and gets some kind of adrenaline kick out of doing these crazy things all the time. Um, she was the sort of person that I would have seen more as a companion rather than her husband, to be perfectly honest. Um, but in terms of her performance, um, you know, she's smart, she's fast, she's tough, she, uh, you know, she's brave, she's like a lot of companions in that respect. Sadly, I knew she was going to die. Um, couldn't not, because I am the Fandai master, and so I'm plugged in enough to what's going on with various series to know who was going to be the next companions. And so the moment that she came on the screen and she was married to Graham, I thought, well, there's two possibilities here now. Either we can leave her behind, because I knew she wasn't going to be going with. We can either leave her behind or we can kill her. Big shock, she got killed. Um, even the, uh, the um, um, reactors that I've watched have said the exact same thing. <laughs> oh, she's going to die. Oh, she's going to die. And yeah, she does. She gets killed uh, near the end. Um, interestingly enough, in a similar fall that killed uh, Tom Baker, yet somehow... Um, the doctor survived a fall from low Earth orbit. I don't know, way high up in the altitude. Without telling us, thank you very much. 
leave her literally falling off the cliff, not even a cliffhanger in the last episode. And now she falls into this train and we don't know how the hell she survived. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I certainly believe uh, Sharon Clark's performance. To be honest, having seen her, I'm kind of sorry that she died. I kind of would have liked to see that character go on. But we will see. Uh, they have not yet hooked me with the uh, companions. But I buy them. And that's the whole purpose of the show. Make sure we buy these characters. That's the most important thing on this particular episode. So in terms of some of the production, this was directed by Jamie Childs. Funny he'd have that name. His IMDb goes 2011 to present. God, I'm old. And he has eight director credits. Uh, he has won an award. He won the, won the Royal Television Society Award in 2017 for Vera, which I have no idea what is, but he apparently directed that. Um, okay, uh, direction. Interesting thing to note here. Um, this series is the first time that they've shot using anamorphic lenses. That means that we have what amounts to a wider screen where it's letterboxed at the top and the bottom. Not sure why they did that. Aside from the fact that they may be expecting to put more of these in the theaters than they have previously. This episode right now is playing in a theater downtown someplace. I just didn't have any great desire to go pay money to see it, you know. But they released this one to theaters as well. And so that anamorphic screen, that different aspect ratio, probably works better on a big screen than it does on a small. But they are using that here. Um, the intent, if I understand correctly, was to make the show look more cinematic. Maybe it's so that they can translate these over to films more easily. I don't know. Um, the direction was fine. There is nothing in here that blows your socks off. Um, but, you know, in terms of Doctor Who direction, frankly, there rarely is. Um, it, you know, if you're going to have your socks blown off by something, it's usually some kind of effect. Something that was achieved in post. Um, so there isn't a ton of really creative direction. And, you know, that's not even a problem with Doctor Who per se. Happens a lot on television shows. Again, you're dealing with a horrific schedule, you know, and a director has to be in charge of all that and make sure we don't go over time or over budget. You know, so the director has a lot on their plate uh, in terms of a TV show than they would in a film. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that. They have a lot on their plate in both cases. But in case of a TV director, it's get this done in six days, and if that means you have to work 12-hour days to do it, you're going to work 12-hour days or more. Um, so it doesn't leave you a ton of time to sit down and decide how to be really creative with your camera work. Maybe you can't even afford it. Um, so there's that. But the direction was fine. It was effective. It was appropriate. You know, again, nothing that jumped out at you. There wasn't any shots that I went, ooh, that was cool. Um, it was just competent. And, and that was fine. For a TV show, that's fine, really. Cinematography is by Dennis Crossan, who fortunately has been around since 1985. Uh, his, he's got 35 cinematographer credits to his name and won the Newport Beach Film Festival Award in 2000 for The Clandestine Marriage. Captain Justice is waiting to see Disney Lucas and Disney uh, Fox sue CBS over uh, copyrighted uh, double-bladed lightsaber. And the alien, uh, Utani-looking uh, alien in new Disco Tilly short trek. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. I probably should give it a quick review at some point. I'm not prepared to do it right now. But, uh, yeah, I've seen that short trek thing. Um, I guess the main thing I can say about it is Tilly does the right thing. <laughs> Which is not something we've seen that often in, uh, in Discovery. So, yay for that. Um, but back on Doctor Who here, the cinematography. Um we get into this weird area again with modern filmmaking where it's really hard to tell what the director's doing versus the cinematographer versus some level of collaboration between them and what's achieved in post. You know, half or more, probably a hell of a lot of these are achieved in post. It's one of the reasons that it's hard for me to review these modern films and TV shows because you have a bunch of CGI and you have a lot of creative CGI artists that have achieved a ton of things in post, up to and including lighting. And if you watch Star Trek Continues and you listen to some of the uh, you know, audio for commentary, 
they're achieving everything in post. It's just amazing. And I'm sure that's the case with motion pictures and TV shows as well now. They're achieving everything in post. How can I critis critique something when I don't know whether it's achieved in post or on the set and I don't know who did the post-production work aside from, you know, generally probably an army of people. And I don't know who to credit, what to what. Because so much is done in post now. So the cinematography is just hard for me to judge. You know, I, I, I don't know what the cinematographer did versus achieved in post versus what the director went. It's not a clue. So, you know, I can only fall back to the minimum. You know, you need to, know, need to see what you're supposed to be looking at and know what you're supposed to look at. Seeing what you were supposed to look at was actually a little problematic in places. Sometimes it was because of the night shooting or soundstage night shooting. I don't know which it was. No doubt there was a lot of green screen. But there was places where it was hard to see things. Um, there was a bunch of places like that. Now, I don't know how much of that is necessarily cinematographer because, again, you're dealing with a whole bunch of post-production uh, but there were points at which it was difficult for me to see what I was supposed to see. Um, however, I did know what I was supposed to look at. So there's that. Again, you know, critiquing this stuff is really hard because I don't know who did what. I don't know what was achieved in post and what was not. You know, I can, I can make some assumptions based on what I know about, you know, like Star Trek Continues or other shows or other movies. I have to say, probably there were a lot of green screens around. Where? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Did they, I mean, I think they did some location shooting, but I can't be certain about that. I can't be certain about it. The whole thing with the bike looks like it was location shooting, but I can't be sure about that. Could have been a lot of green screen in there. I don't know. Looked the location, but I, you can't tell anymore. So. Captain Jesse says, A small foot was hilariously funny uh, movie, and 3D was well done. Why does 3D work better in animated than live action? I think it depends. I, I don't know. Uh, I guess I've never noticed much of a difference. Uh, I've just noticed that I don't want to go to 3D movies anymore. <laughs> uh, it's a gimmick I wish would die. Um, I don't want to go to 3D movies anymore. Um, you know, it's a weird deal because I got into a very strange state of mind one time. We'd gone to Chicagoland to visit my ex's uh, parents, and we were there, and they had uh, Star Wars Episode Two was playing on an IMAX theater. I'd never seen Star Wars Episode Two in an IMAX theater. I went to it, and it was pretty amazing because you can freaking see Natalie Portman's pores. I didn't know she had pores, but you can see them in IMAX. And, uh, and you get a little bit of more appreciation for some of the CGI in there because you, know, you knew some of these characters were all CGI, and they looked pretty good on IMAX. Didn't see it in 3D. But the weirder part about that was the show right after that was... I think Muppet Treasure Island or somebody's Treasure Island. There's been several. Um, and my kids want to see that. So I saw Star Wars Episode Two, and then this other thing on IMAX back to back. Like four hours of IMAX is too much. <laughs> I walked out of there almost in a daze because your brain is now it's processing all this stuff going on on the screen, and then you switch back to real life, and you're just kind of like, what? <laughs> it was a good thing my ex was driving. Uh, but in terms of 3D, I, I don't know. Sometimes it works. I, Day of the Doctor in 3D, that was good. I went to a theater to see that with a bunch of other fans. Great experience. And again, best Doctor Who episode ever. And that one worked in 3D because they didn't kill you with the 3D. You know, they used it appropriately in various places. It was not attempting to just use it as a gimmick so that it was 3D. They had some 3D stuff in there, but it was appropriate locations and it made sense. You know, the, the crazy 3D, I mean. Obviously, you're going to have characters interacting in 3D where they have a background that looks like it's far away and things like that. But when it comes to the big crazy stuff, I thought it worked well. Um, you know, in terms of other stuff, I'm not even sure. I don't much watch it anymore. I, uh, particularly after uh, Last Jedi, I, I left that theater in such a weird haze. I thought, no, no, never again. I'm never going to watch a show in 3D, movie in 3D ever again. 
So more of the production about this episode. There was Arwell Jones as the production designer with an IMDb that goes 1997 to present with 16 production episode credits. He did do 24 episodes of the Sarah Jane Adventures, 14 episodes of Sherlock, and 12 episodes of Wizards vs. Aliens, which I have no idea what it is. He's won some awards. He won the BAFTA three times in 2011 for Sherlock, in 2013 for Sherlock, and 2014 for Sherlock. He also has six other nominations. His production design is fine. It is largely functional. You know, you have to have these sets because this is what the script says. Um, I wouldn't say there's a ton that was terrifyingly, uh, you know, innovative or creative that he was doing there. Um, but it worked fine. It was fine. Again, you're always dealing with this limitation of a TV budget, TV time, TV amount to do things, and this hectic, horrible schedule. And you always, always in these circumstances have to make decisions that are purely business-based that frack up some of your creative decisions. The thing I would notice most about the production design is that for the most part, they have, as I said, taken this direction. They have gone away from this being a horror story because, as we all know, when you make The Doctor Too Dark, people stop watching. And so you see this even in the production design, the costumes, God, especially the costumes, um, but you see it all in the production design. We are not doing washed out gray anymore. We are seeing colors for the first time in about three years since Capaldi was in here because that's what Stephen Moffat did when he jumped the shark. If you even watch it, if you even watch those episodes, you will notice that they are shot washed out, always. So here we have some sets that are not dark. You know, there, there are some outdoor stuff going on, but, you know, in the dark. But the sets are more designed for something that's a little lighter, and, uh, and it shows in this production design. Hey, Super Crew 63 how are you doing? Uh, may, uh, Jesse Kemp just says, maybe the new Doctor took a conservative point of view and not pissed off fans like CBS, Paramount, and Star Wars. Um, yeah, I talked about it a bit earlier. Um, you know, there's some vocal fans who were very, very worried that this was a jump the shark moment for the whole series and that we were going to get social justice warrior nonsense, feminist BS. We didn't get that in this episode, and I don't think we're going to. And I also want to you know, always point out the number of people who cared about that was infinitesimally small. We're dealing with a fandom that has been perfectly fine with strong female characters ever since the first pilot of Star Trek, which I think finished or was shown around the year that I was born. That's how long we've, we haven't cared. We're perfectly fine with it. We always have been in my entire fracking life. There were maybe two or three very vocal people, but most of us, fine with it. As long as they didn't go crazy social justice warrior or, you know, crazy feminist on us. And they didn't. They didn't do that. So I thought it was great. And yes, they're not pissing off the fans. You're absolutely right. We don't have Chibnall coming out to us and say you must like Doctor Who because there is a female doctor. No, no, he's not doing that. He's letting, I think he's going to let the writing and the characters stand on their own, which is the perfect way to do this. And again, totally bought her, totally bought her. I could hear Matt Smith's lines coming out of her mouth, and I liked that. So, <laughs> totally buy her. Uh, let's see. Yeah, oh, one thing about it, you know, despite the fact the, the, the companions are not appropriately frightened sometimes. Um, Graham is one thing. I kind of like that. But on the other, you have all these people up on these freaking, you know, catwalks on a crane, 50 stories in the sky or wherever they are, and it's just a couple of throwaway lines. Um, no. Have you ever noticed when you're up at a high point and looking down, your toes tend to curl? This is indicative that we are descended from something resembling simians that had prehensile toes because your toes are trying to grab on to something. And I don't know about everybody, but it, I, I get up at heights that would be that high, and I would just be hanging on for dear life. <laughs> you couldn't get me to walk around on those things as if it wasn't incredibly high in the sky, you know, and that's kind of what they do. 
Uh, it, it's a writing thing more than anything else, but it's one of those deals where I went, wait a minute, they're way the frack up in the sky. They should be scared spitless at this point. Super Crew 63 says, I miss River Song. I hope to bring her back. I think her story is done. I think we have now seen her entire story. Now that she spent, what, 24 years with Capaldi's doctor? Well, what happened to her right after that was uh, silence, uh, the silence of the library. I've forgotten. But what is chronologically her last adventure? I think we're done with her. And I think we're going to continue to be done with her. Um, they got rid of all that romance stuff so that they could bring in a female doctor. I don't think we're going to see that kind of romance with her, at least not in the beginning, because it raises too many questions for the viewer. What is her sexuality exactly? You know, she can be, is she, you know, is she now a lesbian? Because she was into girls as a man, or has that flipped? At this point, it asks too many questions. Yeah. Doctor Who's um, audience always matriculates. You know, I saw it with my own kids. And it, it happened to me, too, when I was watching it. We matriculate. We watch Doctor Who for a while, and then other life concerns come along, and we tend to drift away. So by kind of getting rid of all this baggage of, you know, all these romances the Doctor has had, set us up for a female Doctor where we don't ask those questions. And if they're going to do anything with it, I think it'll be after their audience has matriculated enough so they don't really remember or haven't ever experienced all of these romances the Doctor has had. Um, so as I say, I don't, th I think, don't think River Song is coming back. I think we have seen the end of her story. And if they did bring her back, it would ask, ask too many questions. And this is, after all, in the UK, a children's show. Now, they've never been afraid to put gay into the show. But here, we have to say, wait a minute. It really does bring up questions about the doctor's sexuality that I don't think they're ever going to touch. So... Yeah, Heights, uh, Captain Jesse says you go into full panic uh, anxiety attack mode. Um, I've been up much, much shorter ones than that. Uh, when I've been work, like for this one uh, movie theater, Cineplex, that I did, they had a very large uh, entryway, you know, just, I don't know, about three stories tall. And I had to get up and do some networking up there. So they ran me up on the A-frame. I'm just like, okay, I'm tethering myself <laughs> And and I'll try not to think about this. The thing's shaking while I'm doing this, you know. Get up that high and, you know, the winds and all that. I'd, I'd be scared out of my pants. And the fact that none of the companions really were. They're so, wow, this is really high. And the guy who was scared was the one who was jumping across. And he didn't seem as scared as he ought to be considering. So it was just one of those deals. It was kind of a cringe moment, but not much of one again. It's not the point of the episode at all. Visual effects for this episode were done by uh, Des Anwar. Uh, his IMDb started out in 2015. But he does have 11 visual effects credits, one of which is for Black Mirror. Then he has 10 episodes of Will, which I have no idea what is, and 10 episodes of American Odyssey that I have not seen. Captain Jesse says, uh, Captain Jesse says the Doctor is the main Doctor Who character, and the BBC changes very little about that. Um, it depends. It depends. Uh, a lot of times when you get a new doctor, you can get something of a new change in format. And that's one of the things I like about this show, is it is telegraphing in many, many ways to us that this is going to be a much lighter tone than it was with Capaldi. Again, uh, the problem is, and uh, Stephen Moffat did not get this, when you make the doctor too dark, people stop watching. And that's what happened. And uh, so they've got this dramatic shift in tone and dramatic shift in pace. We're back to what we came to expect from the Doctor from about 2005 until the Capaldi era, for reasons that I kind of talked about. But we're, we've gone back. We have gone back to that, and I think it's going to attract more audience back. And again, the fact that this episode had the highest ratings the show has seen since Matt Smith's last episode kind of tells you a lot. Um, so the visual effects, uh, they were generally fine. Um, the geometric design hanging in the air, you know, the one that first appeared, 
was really, really reminiscent of Dr. Strange. Uh, I assume that they had to know that it was, and it was probably intentional. Um, but I, found, I just went, that was the only thing I could think about. It pulled me out and said, oh, Dr. Strange. Uh, again, not, not bad. It was fine. It was just, you know, very reminiscent of that. I thought that the uh, pod materializing, the one that looks like the uh, Hershey's Kiss, materializing um, was uh, kind of looked fake. And uh, they didn't show that for very long. I also thought the pod itself, when it was sitting out in the uh, trees, sorry, I gotta slide this back because it's taking my green screen out of frame. Um, I thought that shot looked fake. Um, when they had that out there, uh, you know, the, the distance shots like this one, all I could think was, wow, it looks like something that's been superimposed, uh, you know, against a real uh, background. I thought that looked kind of fake. Um, again, they're always operating with TV shows under a significant pressure in terms of time, money, etc. And so it may just be that they couldn't make it look any better. I don't know. But it looked fake to me. It looked like something that was placed in the forest background. It looks like, it looked, it looks like the background I sometimes use of uh, the Badlands, and then I have the little tiny TARDIS in the background. I think if you look closely at that, you'll probably see that it looks like somebody was photoshopping something in there who had very little talent at it. Um, again, I just thought it from a distance, it looked kind of fake. But, you know, otherwise the effects are fine. It's not the focus of this show. There are a bunch of effects, you know, electricity effects and stuff like that. And I had no problem with those. Although the um, being that was at the center of all that electricity was sometimes hard for me to make out because of all the effects laid on top of it. Maybe you had to. I don't know. But, you know, effects were fine. Again, most of this episode in terms of the plot, in terms of everything else, is either kind of meh. Or it's, okay, good, I can look at this and see that someone told them you have to make the tone lighter. Because if you make the Doctor too dark, people stop watching. <laughs> so, Makeup here was done by Clara Pritchard, who has an IMDb. Yay, it goes all the way back to 1999 with 28 makeup department credits. Worked on Star Wars The Last Jedi. Has 26 episodes of Tatty's Hotel, 25 episodes of Torchwood, 10 episodes of Stella, and 11 of Sherlock. She has won awards. Make sure I'm saying she, yes, Claire Pritchard. She won awards. She won the BAFTA three times, 2011 for Stella, 2014 for Sherlock, and 2017 for Lady Chatterley's Lover. She also won the Hollywood Makeup Artist and Hairstylist Award in 2015 for Sherlock and has five other nominations. The makeup here is, is fine. Um, nothing that blew me away. Uh, the only non-human makeup is, uh, see if I get this right, Zim Shah, the alien character. Um, as is usually the case with Doctor Who, it was believable. However, oddly enough, for some reason, and I'm not sure what it is because they don't really look that much alike, but for some reason, that character reminded me of the Kodans from The Last Starfighter. I'm not sure why. <laughs> they don't look that much similar. Uh, and certainly, you know, the Kodans are not running around with teeth all over their faces. Uh, but for some reason, it reminded me of that, and I'm not sure why. You know, there's the Kodans on the one side and, you know, the other guys on the other. So, I don't know. Just struck me that way. Um, in terms of the rest of the makeup, it's functional. It is there to give our characters so that they look human. And they do throughout. There's no problem with the makeup. And, you know, believe it or not, that's something you can see if it's done badly because we have such high definition now. You know, I didn't watch this. I, I have a 720p copy of it now. I did not watch it on my 40-inch monitor because if I had, I would have gotten too much pixelation. But uh, when you have that really high res... If they're not doing the makeup right, if it's too much, if it's too little, you notice it. You know, So anybody who's doing TV or films now, I always have to give them a certain level of credit, even if the makeup isn't you know, spectacular or they're not doing 35 aliens or something like that. They can get it right 
so that it looks good in extraordinarily high definition. You know, I, I would not want to be an actor today. I mean, look at me. I'm in 720p at 10th frame per second. Someday, my, my, my dream is to have this show streaming out at 1080p with uh, 60 frames per second. I'm afraid that if I do that, all of the various imperfections in my skin, and particularly my teeth, uh, will become readily apparent to everyone where maybe they're inclined to overlook it right now because I'm not in that greater resolution. I would not want to be an actor working today. You know, you have to look really amazing all the time. You have to make sure that your hair and your makeup is perfect every single time because people are watching you in such high definition you can't afford to not do that. You know, so give her some credit for that in any case. So, Costume and wardrobe, costume design was by... Uh, Ray Holman, another guy, fortunately, has an IMDb that runs a little longer than just being inside this decade. <laughs> he has 1989 to present with 26 costume designer credits. He has 31 episodes of Doctor Who. He's done this before. 28 episodes of Wizards vs. Aliens, 27 episodes of Torchwood, and 24 episodes of Broad to Church. He's won the BAFTA in uh, 2008 for Torchwood and has five other nominations. Uh, Super Crew 63 says the last Starfighter was fun. I love the line. We are outnumbered. Uh, 1001 will be a slaughter. That's the spirit. Yes. Yeah. I like Last Starfighter. I know the effects probably don't hold up that well today to modern viewers, but I still like the movie. It's it's just a fun little space opera. That's really all it is. So costumes uh, largely functional. You know, you have a police costume. You have, you know, two people who are older and married. Uh, it worked fine. It was, you always, with the costuming, you have to remember this is all done intentionally. So nothing that goes on these people is by accident. It's all there to drive home more about the character. What sort of clothes would this person wear? And uh, they got that fine. They got that fine. There was nothing, you know, when I, when I see it, it's, if it's wrong, it jumps out at me. And this never jumped out at me, so the costumes were fine in that respect. Uh, Captain just says, how is the water? Oh, my water's fine, as usual, just keeping me hydrated, which is what it's there for. Um, there was, you know, the costume for the alien, like the story, reminded me of Predator. And I'm not sure why, because it doesn't really look the same. You know, neither the character's makeup, nor the helmet it wears, nor the costume really look that much like Predator. But it still felt like that for some reason. You know, you didn't have all the amazing weaponry and all that on the suit, but it still reminded me of Predator. And it may have just been because the, the, the friggin' story is so much derivative of Predator. Um, now, I don't know... Who came up with the new doctor's costume? One would have to assume that it must be some level of the costume of Ray Holman. It is an interesting and probably appropriate choice. To begin with, we've changed the tone. Capaldi's doctor wore dark. Her doctor is wearing incredibly bright colors, you know, that don't even necessarily match. But it still works. It's not like Colin Baker. That stuff that he wore was just horrifying. And when they've done aftermarket stuff with him, they gave him a nice blue coat. So this is just crazy. Um, with her, it's definitely very crazy. Um, but part of that is to telegraph, we are changing our tone. It's no more washed out stuff. It's no more wearing black. It is we are colorful and action again. So in that respect, I thought it worked. But one of the interesting things about that, I think I may have said this elsewhere, um, yeah, the Captain Jesus says uh, the new costume is bright and feminine. Yeah, it's it's to some extent it is, but what I was interested in, from a costuming perspective, is what it tones down, what it's hiding. You have to remember this is a children's show in the UK. The BBC does not want mothers calling them to tell them that little Johnny is whacking to the doctor. There are endless pics of Jodie Whittaker looking awesome. And in fact, she's done nude scenes before. The BBC does not want mothers calling to tell them 
that little Johnny is whacking to the doctor. And so they've done some specific things with costuming in order to tone down the feminism of, uh, uh, of Jodie Whittaker. The costume very intentionally minimizes the appearance of her breasts, her hips, and her legs. Very, very minimizing. You know, even the, even the, the pants she's wearing, they don't go all the way to the bottom. You can see some of her legs, but not all of it. You know, and the same thing with the top she's wearing, right? Not only is it dark and fitting, which tends to squash things down, it also has vertical lines directly across, I mean, horizontal lines, just straight across. You can't even think really about seeing her breasts. So this is all intentional. It's all very intentional. And again, I'm not sure how much of this was this costume designer versus uh, a producer and stuff like that. But that's what it did. It is a feminine looking costume. Don't get me wrong. Captain Jesse is right about that. But it is clearly minimizing much about her figure. And I'm sure that that is because somebody at the BBC said, make sure <laughs> mothers are not calling us to tell us their 13 year old kid is whacking to the doctor. Music in this episode is provided by Sagun Akinola with an IMDb that again is inside this decade, 2012 to current. 23 per composer credits, credits and seven music department credits. He's never done a full series, but he's done multiple episodes of various TV series. He was nominated for, I, I'm going to pull out this nomination specifically because of what it was, the Jerry Goldsmith Award in 2017. He was nominated for that, so... Maestro Jerry Goldsmith. I didn't even know there was one named after him, and there is. All right, music here is a big deal. The music in this show had previously been provided by Murray Gold, and he'd been with the show since 2005. You know, so he's been with this sucker 13 years or 12 years, and he decided to bow out. And his stuff tended to be very big, very bombastic, sometimes to the point where it maybe didn't even fit the action specifically, but it was huge, it was big, it was orchestral, it was bombastic. Um, you know, it's very memorable. A lot of individual themes. When he, he did individual themes for each of the doctors. They each had their own individual music cue. And, you know, the, a bunch of music that was then based on it and everything like that. Uh, Cam just says, the new Doctor Who costume makes the new Doctor look about 200 pounds. I don't know. She doesn't look like that heavy to me, but just to me looking at it, I went, wow, look at what we're not seeing. <laughs> look at what they are clear. I mean, you could have put her in something low cut, tight dress. No, no. Didn't even think about it. So, um, so the problem is coming into this episode in 2018, 13 years after Murray Gold started doing the music for this and doing some amazing music, you can't walk into it without comparing it to Murray Gold's music. You, you know, you just can't. Now, in terms of comparing it, I would have to say we can't tell yet for sure. We've only seen one episode, and I do like what we're hearing. Um, it's not Murray Gold, um, but then nobody would be. You know, it's a new uh, guy doing the music. And so, you know, we're going to have to wait and see. We're going to have to wait and see how this music turns out. Uh, Larry Larry says, background from Tom Baker's TARDIS. Yes, complete with his uh, later red, all red scarf. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's hard to find ones, believe it or not, that are uh, high res. What you're seeing here, actually, um, is a picture. They, have, they had a display <laughs> with that set on it. And so that's where I pulled that. Somebody took a picture of that. That's somebody's picture. Um, a little changed because I didn't want you to see the top of it and I didn't want you to see one side. But that actually works out because I have the TARDIS over my, sh I mean the console over my shoulder. Most of the ones you look at are taken with the console straight in center frame. The problem is I'm sitting here so you can't see center frame. So I was happy to find that one. Um, memorable things about this music. A blaster beam or a near blaster beam was used occasionally. If, if you don't know what a blaster beam is, um, heavily used in Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, anytime you saw a V'ger, typically you would hear this brawm of the blaster beam. Heard that a couple of times in here. There was, I think there was a blaster beam or something very like it. I kind of like that. I thought it worked well. For me, it, I couldn't help but think of V'ger from Star Trek, the motion picture, but I thought it worked pretty well. The titles. The titles are always something that's difficult to get down on this show, and they've done it really well in the past. I was not happy with Capaldi's. Same reason. 
dark and you heard that the whole thing was done dark and the main melody was done with that wavering tone that suggested a horror movie and they've changed all that here now we don't know what the opening titles look like yet but i can get what the music is like on the uh on the end titles it is going back very much to what the original theme sounded like the biggest difference you know in terms of musically is that drum beat underneath there's that heavy heavy drum beat that i don't like very much i don't like that at all um, if you're going to go back and do the original that's fine but keep the drum beat something bass you know dun 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 they usually they've done that with some level of bass in the past especially when you get to the original um you're, you're hearing some cues that are the original theme was written at a time when we didn't have synthesizers and all this stuff you know they got the sounds very complexly and then they would have to string them together on you know magnetic tape and and cut them together so that they worked together now we have all this stuff and i i think the drum beat is wrong for that i think it's just too much too much um so i don't like that very much but again uh at least it isn't screaming at you the entire theme for capaldi was screaming you know if you think about the way the music is it sounds like someone's screaming the way through so changing that is fine I, I and i understand you don't want to do a big bombastic thing the way that murray gold did you want to put some other stamp on it so you go back and you know kind of see what you can do with the original i don't think it was bad i'll be interested to see what the what the new titles look like at the beginning um but as music it wasn't bad i just don't like the drum beat in the background uh Kevin just says does the new TARDIS look uh, way too advanced inside or more classic it depends which one you're talking about the TARDIS has typically been kind of steampunk in uh, 2005 on you know we see bits and pieces of you know like an old manual typewriter and stuff like that uh, it tends to have been pretty steampunk it n it has never bothered me the way that it looks because you can say uh, uh, Larry Larry saying uh, Mellotron Moog synthesizers yeah it didn't even have those particularly um, you know when they were getting some of those sounds if you if you watch some of the behind the scenes stuff as somebody who's an audiophile I am floored at what the BBC Radiophonic Workshop did to get that original uh, theme they would get you know one sound like that uh, that underlying bass well they got dun dun dun, -dun and then they took that duplicate it and then physically attached it to the magnetic tape so they get dun 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 dun, dun, dun over and over again <laughs> it wasn't even hitting keys on a keyboard it was getting the tape and putting it together so that always amazes me um where was i uh well yeah anyway we'll see about the music we'll see about the music this is again the whole point of this episode point of any first episode of a doctor is will the audience buy the doctor and to a secondary extent will they buy the companions and yes totally bought this doctor nothing wrong with her here i very much like what she's doing so far what happens in the future we will see uh, and hopefully uh, chibnall will be turn out to be a creative uh, writer the way that moffat was before he jumped the shark Coming to the end of the uh, review, fortunately, I'm probably only going to hit two hours tonight, amazingly enough. But again, this was a show I did not intend to have. Uh, I just ended up coming back from uh, the family ranch land a day early. And we had some rain out there. And with much rain, there's a very large hill you have to get up. With much rain, the bottom just turns into muddy, slippery crap that's impossible to cover. So I didn't want to run the risk of being out there for six months. <laughs> oh, probably only a couple of weeks. But I didn't have the provisions for it. I only came for three days. Larry Zoya says, the Beatles did lots of crazy, thing, crazy things with tape recordings. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm an audiophile. And way back when, I used to do exactly the same thing. Uh, back in the ancient mists of time, before there was uh, videotape, well, me and my friends would usually audio tape Star Trek. And we're talking about not something that you could plug an audio tape cassette recorder into the TV. There were no jacks to do that for the most part. Some TVs occasionally had a little headphone jack, but for the most part, that didn't exist. So what you ended up doing was running the uh, microphone cord 
around the um, channel selector knobs. There were two channel selector knobs, one for UHF and one for VHF. And you would run it down through the channel selector knobs so it was fairly stable and right in front of the thing. I used to like, I got really good at pausing the tape recorder when the commercials came on, such that you would never hear it. But sometimes I did. And I would splice the thing myself. I would go out and get a razor, and I actually had a little splicing machine. It was not much of a splicing machine. You just lay the magnetic tape in it and slice and then put it together. Uh, but I used to do that. So watching, you know, what they did to get that original theme and just splicing together the entire damn thing, you know, practically instrument by instrument, just blows my mind. But, yeah, Beatles doing crazy things. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I didn't know that much about them, but I'm, I'm not stunned. You know, that band would do some crazy stuff. So this is the end of the review, so we can ask ourselves, is it any good? It's okay. It's okay. Uh, the story is derivative. Um, it's definitely not the show's best episode, but give them time. Give them some time. Uh, it sometimes will take a, a little while for a, a new doctor to you know, hit their stride. Um, so we'll wait and see how it goes. The good performances were good, if not especially memorable. And it is a decent enough Doctor Who first episode. You know, where we're dealing with a new doctor, and we have to make sure that everybody buys this person before we go off and do some crazy stuff. So I think we'll see more of that as the show goes on. It'll be interesting to see how it works. Um, I am really interested because, of course, the, the trailer that they've shown saw some really interesting stuff in terms of the effects and where they go. So I'm kind of interested to see how that goes. This episode did not knock my socks off, but it did help get some of the bad taste out of my mouth that I had with Capaldi. And again, not Capaldi's fault. It was Stephen Moffat's fault for having jumped the shark and gone the only direction he could think of, which was dark. And that doesn't work. Again, um, the John Nathan Turner rule, if you make the Doctor too dark, people stop watching. Now, I was a crazy fan, um, so I watch regardless. But, you know, the darkness inherent in that Doctor, not Capaldi's fault, but ejecting it and showing us very clearly right now that we have ejected that. We have gone to a lighter tone and a faster paced Doctor, which is fine. Um, I don't know. We'll see how Chibwell does it, but I don't think she's going, he's going to blow any holes in Companion's chest or kill them off in horrible ways like they did Clara. You know, death and horror was basically everything Capaldi did. Uh, and it just doesn't work for me. And I don't think it worked for most viewers. Again, we're talking about an episode yesterday that got the highest views since Matt Smith's last episode. It had been going down to, from that point. So that is what I think of this episode. Um, story's okay. Kind of derivative in a couple of places. But it's okay. And, and it does work as an episode to introduce our new doctor and say to the audience, will you buy her? And they've been marketing this before this as well. One of the trailers they had out there actually has the doctor saying, if I did this, if I did that, would you be my new best friend? This is saying to the audience, <laughs> please accept me. If I do these things, will you believe me as the doctor? And they do. I do. I do. Totally buy her. Uh, I'm looking forward to more episodes with her. I want to see how she works, how she does things. So, yay. Larry Larry says, Matt Smith's doctor uh, seeing a lady wearing a Tom Baker scarf is funny. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I get a kick out of uh, um, uh, Osgood, regardless. I get a kick out of Osgood. And, and she is very much, I mean, uh, you know, that was one of the good things that um, uh, um, Stephen Moffat did. And a getway killing her actually worked. I was not happy when they, he did it at first. But because that character is, he said it himself, she's like a cosplayer. So if you're at a con cosplaying her, you're cosplaying a cosplayer. That's, that's actually what Moffat said. Um, she is the audience's Mary Sue in a traditional way. You know, in as much as we are seeing ourselves in Osgood. Those of us who are fans really see ourselves in Osgood. And uh, yeah... Um, her having the scarf and the bow tie after that, yeah, it was wonderful. I, I love Osgood. I just love Osgood. You know, when she was asked by the doctor, she wanted to go with. Again, she is the audience's Mary Sue. She is literally a Mary Sue in a very traditional way. We're taking the audience or somebody like them and putting them in this show. 
and I really loved her because of that. So hope she comes back. I assume she will. There's really no reason the doctor couldn't occasionally have an adventure where Unit comes into play. So that's the end of the review, so we might have a little bit of news. Uh, as we all know now, from the brilliant study done by one Dr. something Bay, I don't remember. Fortunately, due to his brilliant work, we now know that the fandom that did not like The Last Jedi was mostly Russian trolls. Or bots. Thank God. You know, I wouldn't have guessed. I wouldn't have guessed. Brilliant, brilliant man who came out with that stupid, stupid theory. Such that if you watch back a little bit in my archives, I did a thing where I was pretending to be a Russian mastermind behind the whole thing. Because that whole idea is so stupid. And I've read a little bit of the, uh, of the uh, actual paper. And his methodology is so fantastically flawed to come to any kind of conclusions about anything. You know, it's clear that none of the press actually read the thing. Because if they did, they'd find that it was hideously flawed in terms of his methodology. Just fantastically flawed. But he came out and he said it. And, uh, you know, people like Ryan Johnson are now going, yay, see? And, and Kathleen Kennedy are saying, yay, see? It was just, it was just a bunch of rotten Russian bots who were driving all that. Dr. Bay and everybody else, i got to tell you, you're completely full of crap. Anybody who reads that study will come to the conclusion that methodology is so far off in the twilight zone. So that's my science fiction news for this week. Russian bots have invaded science fiction. They're going to take down Star Wars as opposed to the last one just being a movie that a lot of people didn't like. Yes, Larry. Larry says, so now when anything goes wrong, blame the Russians. Yes. Oh, God. You know, thank Hillary Clinton for starting that. And, and thank all of the people on the left who glommed on to an utterly ridiculous um, theory that, you know, and this stupid report that was done by people who were looking for dirt on Trump, not having any basis in reality. Now we've had a freaking investigation going on, basically the entire administration that's pointless and stupid. And of course, you know, just to add insult to injury, because right, the Russians aren't satisfied with all the meddling in elections, which by the way, if the Republicans win the midterms, I guarantee you, guarantee you, we will start to hear a lot of screaming about how it was Russia that interfered directly in that election to put them in office. But, yeah, yeah, Larry, Larry, I mean, Super Cruise and S63, they weren't just satisfied with screwing up the elections. They also had to get into popular culture by infecting Star Wars. And, yes, yes, we'll now have to all go, those of us who didn't like the movie and are not Russian bots, will all have to go to the gulag. Or, for that matter, hey, Russia, if you want to pay me to not like Last Jedi, I have no problem with that. <laughs> I got no problem with that whatsoever. Give me a check. I'd be happy to take a check for not liking Last Jedi, for God's sake. That's stupid. Some other news in tech world. Um, Google Plus is shutting down because between 2015 and 2018, there was a bug that exposed user data to any competent programmer. And they did not disclose it until they decided to shut uh, Google Plus down. Now, they fixed it earlier this year. But for three fracking years, you could pull almost any information that the user had put in there out of there. And I had a fair amount of information in there with my Google account, not with uh, Google Plus per se. But all this Google account stuff, you know, my relationships to people, my uh, birth date, birth date of the people that I'm associated with, various groups that I'm associated with, etc., 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 could all be pulled out by any competent programmer. Not even a hacker, just a competent programmer. So they're shutting down Google+, Plus. not that they weren't going to do that anyway. It was a complete failure. They thought they were going to kick uh, Facebook off the Internet and miserably failed. I have occasionally gone there, but, 
you know, uh, solely for advertising purposes lately. It's just to advertise the show. Um, but they're shutting down, and I'm not surprised. You know, Google Plus was a complete failure, um, such that people on YouTube, when it first came out, and they were integrating the two, Google Plus with YouTube. Um, that was how I got to, um, uh, that's how I got to watching um, um, Emma Blackery. She did a song, a little short one, a couple of verses, and she played on a ukulele to it because she was so ticked off, and that's what drew me to her originally. Uh, it was a song called Fuck You, Google Plus. <laughs> and there's been people who covered that. Search YouTube for cover and Fuck You, Google Plus. There's a guy who's done an entire band doing that. You know, it's amazing. There's so many people who've covered it because they all felt the same way. Uh, Larry Larry says, script kiddies. No, it wasn't even script kiddies. It was just any competent programmer. Anybody who wanted could pull that. Anybody who had the wherewithal to use an online application programming interface and API, which all of these services have. You know, sometimes a service is not actually providing what you think it is. It's actually providing an API. There are whole businesses out there that are API businesses, not something that you see necessarily in front of you, but a back-end programming structure such that competent programmers can use it to pull out information, maybe add information back in and so forth. Um, so, yeah, that's what they had. It was leaking like a sieve, apparently. Uh, Supercruise 63 says, never used Google Plus. Well, you're probably lucky. Um, I guess I've been out there a few times. Uh, it is basically the same pest hole as as Facebook is with people screaming at each other and, you know, all that. And Whenever I advertise the show, I will sometimes post in uh, science fiction groups. I had some guy come back and say, oh, I'm not going to watch this. This is crap. you got a lot of crazy theories. Because if you look at my, pa my uh, 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 channel page, I do have some of the stuff I've talked about out there. And I was just like, okay, so you're not going to watch? Um, fine. Uh, nobody is forcing you to watch my show. <laughs> Why would you even say that? Why scream that out, you know, aside from to be a jerk? And that's what social media tends to turn people into anyway. Um, you know, like uh, like uh, Jesse Milestone, who I did a show with, and she's talked about maybe doing a, uh, a cast with me, so that would be cool. Um, this last week she posted something about uh, the uh, Kavanaugh situation. She was, she was very much against Kavanaugh for a number of reasons. I don't necessarily agree with her, but... She was getting just tons of hate, not surprisingly, on social media. Everybody who disagreed with her piled on. I just said, well, you know, ultimately it's a political difference of opinion. I'm a libertarian. Almost nobody has my political opinions. So if I made uh, you know, politics a litmus test, I'd have absolutely no friends whatsoever. And I also said, hey, you know, we can always hate Last Jedi together. <laughs> Um, but she got a ton of hate from people, you know, just for posting it. And that's what social media does to you. You put up your opinion and suddenly there's 5,000 people screaming about how you're an idiot and you're wrong and you're a horrible person. Just for what amounts to a difference in political opinion. So that's kind of my news for the week. Uh, Super Crew 63 says, you, you did see the SpaceX launch and landing last night. It was beautiful. It was about, oh, you live about 10 miles from the launch site? Well, that's pretty cool. I almost saw a shuttle launch once from a very safe distance, uh, and then it was scrubbed like three minutes, three seconds before the thing went up. I still have the T-shirt somewhere. <laughs> you know, a T-shirt that talks about when it launched and everything, it's all wrong. Well, that's pretty cool that you're close enough to see stuff like that. That's awesome. I would love to be able to, you know, get in and see some of that. Um, despite my worry about, about SpaceX being tainted, I would still love to be close enough to see some of that in person. I'm, I've been told by people who saw it that the launch of the Saturn V rocket that took men to the moon was the loudest noise they had ever heard in their lives. Um, I'd love to be that close to something like that. That would be cool. Very cool. Well, oddly enough, inside of two hours, that largely brings me to the conclusion of my show. Um... I guess I could talk a little bit about that short trick with short trek with Tilly. 
Uh, I haven't had time to sit down and analyze it or anything like that. But again, the main thing that I would say about it is, and I'm hopeful that this is something that will carry over, somebody finally did the right thing. These characters are so often making mistakes that lead to horrible outcomes that to see somebody doing the right thing was a relief. <laughs> Hopefully they'll do this going forward into the next season. And lunch at Vandenberg in California? Oh, I see. Okay, well that's, man, you know, again, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see a launch like that. Any kind of launch for that matter. Uh, doesn't even matter to me what it is. I'd just love to be close enough to see it, but that'll never happen. So, the same pads that built for the shuttle were uh, never used for the space shuttle. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I can't say that I'm shocked about that. Really, you know, I've I've seen them, I've seen them in uh, Florida when they're moving some of those stuff around. What's mostly amazing to me is the vehicle that they use. They basically put like a ten-story building on top of a moving platform that goes incredibly slowly. And it was built for the Saturn V. <laughs> I don't know how many stories tall the Saturn V is. I've only seen it laying down there uh, at, in uh, Florida. But that many stories sitting on a rolling platform, holy crap. Oh, yeah, you live in Serving Crew 63. You live in uh, Lompoc, California. I, don't, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, yeah, that's cool. I, I guess I would love to be close enough to see any launch anywhere. I was really disappointed that I didn't get to see that shuttle launch. I thought, okay, this is perfect. I'm down there for a, for a vacation. Did not intend to time it out so that it was going with the shuttle launch. What had happened actually was they'd scrubbed the launch like two weeks previously or more. And so they were going to try a relaunch. And then they scrubbed it like three seconds, T minus three. We actually saw, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, cloud that comes out from the bottom, it's starting to move, and then nothing, just shut it down. So it's cool that you live there and you could see that. I, I, I would love to see some of that. That's very, very cool. Well, I guess at this point I might do a little bit of ad copy. Actually, I didn't write ad copy for this. Holy crap. I knew I was forgetting something. Uh, Larry Larry says, Vandenberg launches are usually for polar orbits, uh, or object orbiting from the north to south or vice versa. Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's cool. That's cool. You learn something new every day. I didn't know it was just it's primarily for polar. So the 63 says they launched the Delta rockets uh, from uh, 66, which was uh, originally for the shuttle. And yes, the towers are on tracks. Yeah. It blows my mind. When I saw it, I was just like, I would be so scared. <laughs> you know, you, last thing you want is for the space shuttle to tip over, you know, or, or worse, the Saturn V rocket, you know, so. I don't have ad copy for this one. Totally spaced it out. Let me see if I can just come up with something off the top of my head. Uh, next time on Tales from SYL Ranch. It's the movie you have been waiting to see. It is the 60th anniversary of Hammer's Dracula. So watch that next time on an all-new episode of Tales from SYL Ranch. And, of course, Tales from SYL Ranch is live here in North America at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific. And if you're working off of UTC, it's 1 a.m. Tuesday morning. Some upcoming reviews. Um... As I say, next week, I've got Dracula. And then October 22nd, because I'm having a show tonight, and so I decided, okay, I'm not going to do a whole Doctor Who next time unless something really weird happens. Uh, I'll be doing many reviews of the series as we go along. Um, so as an episode airs on Sundays, uh, I think it's Sundays, um, I'll be doing a small review afterwards. So. Um, so next week I'm doing Dracula. I moved things around because I thought, well, okay, I've got an empty day here. So I'm moving Dracula into next week. So the week after that I moved it around again and I'm going to do Predestination, the movie uh, that my longtime viewer, Jay Haley, was kind enough to send me. Um, so I'll be doing that in two weeks. 
And then, as I've said before, on October 29th, just in time for Halloween, I will be reviewing the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And then on Halloween itself, I will do a live stream with the audio from the 1938 radio broadcast of the War of the Worlds, which should be kind of interesting. It is its 80th anniversary. I guarantee told you. I'm going to go through and do some context before we get to the to the audio. Not a ton, not like I did for the last ADS review, but probably some, um, because it's useful to know the background. And as I've always said, look into it. This thing is credited for something that never happened. It was just propaganda. Then, on, I don't have anything yet planned for most of November and December. I do on November 12th. However, and just in time for the holidays, I have the 40th anniversary review of the Star Wars Holiday Special, the abridged 45-minute watchable edition. As I said before, I am not going to make you sit through that crap. The entire two hours is horrible. Um, the abridged 45-minute watch watchable edition is somebody's fan edit, and it's pretty good. I mean, the, it's a little low-tech, but that's okay. <laughs> But this piece of junk, it's all right. Uh, and it turns it into at least a coherent movie. Then on December 17th, I'm doing Superman, uh, the movie. Uh, the best Superman movie ever made and probably will be the best one that ever is made. Uh, Larry Larry says, you got an LP of that broadcast? Yeah, I used to have one too. Um, then somebody went and cleaned it up a little bit. You can't clean it up too much. They've gotten different pieces of recordings from different places with varying quality. Um, there's, I'm going to put it up a week or so before, but there's a good, God, I don't remember the name of it. It's still historically wrong, but it's interesting because it's a, it's a docudrama told from the point of view of the people who are involved in that broadcast, you know, actors, direct, director, etc., all those people, uh, while it's happening. And when you watch it, you go, oh, oh, you know, being an audiophile and a fan of old time radio. Listen to it, and you go, oh, you watch this, and you go, yeah, you know, they probably were doing more sound effects than we can hear in that thing, um, because that's what they usually did back then. But you can't hear it because of the crappy audio quality, which you always have to remember on those. God, 1938, they were probably making wire recordings of this. Not even magnetic tape was around then. And I will talk about that when I do the context for that one, so... I guess at this point, I might say something like this. Say, pardon me, but could you help out a fellow American who's down on his luck? Hit the road! So if you like what I'm doing, please like, sub, tell your friends, family, neighbors, and pets to do the same. Hit the notification bell because I'm unclear that you'll ever be notified about anything I do if you don't. Hit my PayPal tip jar if you want. Hit the merch store. It's not going to set you back a ton. It's got the logo on it correctly now. Everything goes towards a laptop, um, and it will make all of my technical problems largely disappear. If you want to buy the laptop for me outright, you can program this show. Anything you want, I will do in any order. And, of course, check out my Patreon if you like. I want to thank everybody who has contributed. I am seeing more and more of these coming in now. Thank you so much. You have no idea what it means to me personally to actually being paid for this stuff in any way. I've often said, you know, actors who actually work, you know, the real working actors are a very, very small number of people. When I was doing it, I made like 1200 bucks one year, and that was considered a success. So for me, doing what is now some level of it's intellectual, but at the same time, it's some level of performing as well. I get a giant kick out of the fact that anybody is paying me to do this. So thank you. Thank you very much. Or in the immortal words of Elvis Presley, Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Larry Larry says, you'll take two laptops. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd take two if I could. But I'd probably sell the other one on eBay for a profit if I could. Uh, anyhow, I do have a merch store. Um, these... These pictures are a little out of date because the logo is updated to be my current logo. But I do have some merch. It's not horribly expensive. I am selling T-shirts, tank tops, hoodies, coffee mugs, stickers, etc. in a variety of sizes and colors. They all have the show logo on the front with the show motto, Always Know Where Your Towel Is. And on the back, it has my show username. Um, 
I want to get out of YouTube so bad, as I've said before, but unfortunately, a number of things are preventing me from doing it still. YouTube is, sadly, the only one out there that does what I need so far. Um, so, the back of the show, thing shows my channel name, which is Dakota WRS3, because at the time when I made this, I didn't think I was going to be doing this show. Uh, if I had to do over again, I'd call it SYL Ranch, but I didn't know I was going to do it. Um, so that's on the back, as well as the secondary motto of the show, nothing that you see in the press is real. Nothing. And I invite you to take a look at what they said happened in 1938 to discover that this is true. So... That is, uh, amazingly, I'm hitting almost exactly two hours. That would be all the time we have today, boys and girls. So tune in again next week for another highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from SYL Ranch, the blogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. <laughs> Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. This is the story of Dracula, a creature who destroys all whom he touches. Dracula the terrifying, the feared, who sleeps in the tombs of the dead by day and arises at night to inflict his terror upon the innocent and the unsuspecting. Oh, you must help me. You must. You're my only hope. You must. This is not Lucy, the sister you loved. It's only a shell, possessed and corrupted by the evil of Dracula. How do you destroy a fiend who has so far proven himself indestructible? Those who come to end his reign of terror stay to become his victims. The castle Dracula is summoned here in Klausenburg. Will you tell me how I get there? You order the meal, sir. As an innkeeper, it's my duty to serve you. When you've eaten, I ask you to go and leave us in peace. This is the doctor who dares to challenge the vampire Dracula. This is the anguished man who fears for the lives of his beloved, the girl who is his sister, and the one that is his wife. Dracula, the bedeviled master of all that is evil.